In Washington, AT&T agrees to settle the Justice Department's seven-year lawsuit seeking to break up the company. In Memphis, Tennessee, one of AT&T's competitors stakes its future on satellite technology. In our Market Monitor segment, analyst Bill Lefebvre discusses the possible impact of the AT&T case. And Alfred Kahn discusses some trends that have shown up in recent economic statistics. Those and other stories on The Nightly Business Report with Del Frank, Linda O'Brien, and Paul Kangas. The Nightly Business Report, made possible by grants from W.R. Grace, a company involved in chemicals, natural resources, and consumer products, and by Cities Service Company, an energy, chemicals, and minerals company, and by public television stations throughout the nation. Now, the Nightly Business Report. Good evening, everyone. The world's largest corporation, American Telephone and Telegraph, has agreed to break itself up into separate companies in order to settle the Justice Department's seven-year-old antitrust suit against it. That agreement provides for AT&T to divest itself of all 22 of its local Bell Telephone operating companies within 18 months. However, AT&T will continue to own its nationwide intercity network, its research arm, Bell Laboratories, and its manufacturing arm, Western Electric. AT&T's 3 million stockholders will keep their stock in AT&T and will also receive proportionate shares of the local exchange companies, which account for two-thirds of AT&T's existing assets. In addition to settling the antitrust suit against AT&T, today's agreement also frees the company to get into the computer data business and other unregulated areas for the first time. That means a whole new ball game in the telecommunications industry, and Helen Whelan reports on some of the effects that will result. The long-distance telephone companies competing with AT&T now have the force of law behind them as they try to hook up to the local telephone system. In the past, these companies claimed AT&T discriminated against them by making it difficult for customers to use their services. With today's decision, local companies will have to give all long-distance companies equal treatment. These companies are all, uh, will all be independent and are required by this decree to uh, uh, to connect uh, in a non-discriminatory manner between all inner city carriers. I presume this is what MCI and the others have been asking for and, and uh, should satisfy them. But just as the independent telephone companies will be better able to compete with AT&T, the opposite holds true. AT&T will now be able to expand its service into computers, cable TV, and other electronic communications. It separates the regulated local companies from the rest of the enterprise and leaves the rest of the enterprise freed of the 1956 consent decree restrictions on activities and free to engage in such ever manufacturing or marketing activities it chooses to engage in. Consumers will benefit from the broader choices they will be given for telecommunication service. However, local and rural rates are expected to go up. At the present time, I would expect although these are very difficult things to determine, and I don't mean to prejudge it by my comments, uh, that those thinly trafficked routes probably are not returning revenues even equal to their costs. And as Mr. Brown so rightly said, rates will have to move in the direction of costs. In its new form, AT&T will be far different from the regulated monopoly it is now. But AT&T officials seem confident that the restructured company will thrive in the newly competitive marketplace. In Washington, Helen Whalen for the Nightly Business Report. Another major antitrust case also bit the dust today as the government gave up trying to break up IBM. The antitrust case against the computer giant, charging that IBM had monopolized the general purpose computer industry, was filed almost 13 years ago and had been in trial for six years. In a statement to Judge David Edelstein, Assistant Attorney General William Baxter said the government's case against IBM was simply, quote, without merit. IBM head lawyer Thomas Barr said the action means IBM is totally vindicated. IBM stock did not trade today. Mobile apparently will not have a chance to get back at U.S. Steel for winning the battle for control of Marathon Oil for at least another 20 days. The Federal Trade Commission today temporarily blocked Mobile's announced plan to buy a large stake in the steel company. 
And while it requests additional information from Mobile on the proposed stock purchase, Mobile has not yet said whether it will comply with the FTC request. The dropping of those two antitrust suits against AT&T and IBM got a good response on Wall Street as prices closed up in moderate trading. With the details, here's Paul Kangas with today's stock market report and commentary. Paul, it was a big day. Yes, it was, Dell. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. After slowly pulling itself up by the bootstraps yesterday, with the Dow Industrial Average erasing a mid-session loss of six points and turning it into a small closing gain of three-quarters point, the stock market opened with a little more spirited rally this morning, despite the Labor Department's report that December unemployment shot up a half point to a lofty 8.9 percent, the worst level in over six years. As far as investors were concerned, however, that news of a deepening recession carried with it the obliquely positive in implication that interest rates may resume a downward course as loan demand shrinks along with business activity. In addition, from the technical standpoint, the market seemed poised to stage some sort of a rebound from what many analysts were saying was an oversold position. In a steady advance then, prices forged ahead from the starting bell, and by the end of the first hour of big board trading, the industrial average posted a two and one half point gain, with advancing stocks outnumbering losers 610 to 370. First hour volume, though, wasn't particularly impressive at 10.8 million shares, only about a quarter million more than at the same time yesterday. But then came those high impact and basically positive announcements regarding the government's antitrust settlement with American Telephone and indications that a settlement with IBM was imminent. Both of these stocks, which are major Dow Industrial Average components, were halted in trading by exchange officials pending further dissemination of the news. There was little question, however, that Wall Street's initial reaction was positive since by one o'clock the Industrial Average moved up to a five and one quarter point gain as advancing issues pushed to a commanding 825 to 450 lead over losers. But three hour volume remained a rather lackluster 25 million shares, less than a half a million ahead of yesterday's pace. Keep in mind, though, that turnover was somewhat negatively affected by the trading halts in telephone and IBM stocks, which are consistently two of the most active issues. To top this off, at 1.59 p.m., trading was stopped in still another active Dow stock, none other than U.S. Steel, when the Federal Trade Commission ruled that Mobile will at least temporarily be prohibited from buying steel stock in a backdoor attempt to gain partial control of Marathon Oil's assets. Meanwhile, for those stocks that were still trading, the news was good, as the industrial average posted better than a six-point gain at three o'clock, while advancing issues widened their lead over losers to a nine to five margin. The market lost a little of its glow in the final hour due to some hesitation prior to the release of the weekly money supply st statistics, but the Dow Industrial Average did manage to hold on to a closing gain of 4.76, putting it at 866.53. For the week overall, however, the Dow still lost 8.47. Then the Federal Reserve reported the encouraging news that in the week ending December 30th, the M1B money supply fell $1.4 billion, while M1A was down $900 million. Well, that's today's first look at Wall Street. I'll be back with the details shortly. Linda? Well, as you've just heard, the Labor Department today reported that the ranks of the nation's unemployed expanded greatly in December as the unemployment rate rose by a half percent to 8.9%. That marked the fifth month of rising unemployment in a row and took the unemployment rate within a fraction of the 9% peak reached during the recession of eight years ago. Blue-collar workers bore the brunt of layoffs during the month, leading the unemployment rate for both adult males and blacks to reach post-World War II highs. Eight percent of adult males were without a job in December, an eight-tenths of one percent jump. And unemployment among blacks rose six-tenths of one percent to 17.4 percent. There were a few relative bright spots in the December employment picture. The unemployment rate among teenagers generally dropped fractionally to 21.7 percent. And unemployment among black teenagers also dropped. The unemployment figures are likely to get worse before they get better. And the pace of factory production has been slowing since August, and that is expected to lead to more layoffs of blue-collar workers. Dell? Well, with unemployment in the auto industry running at 22 percent, United Auto Workers negotiators have voted to reopen the existing contracts of auto workers who still have jobs at General Motors and Ford. In Chicago, the UAW's Ford and GM councils today agreed with a request by union leaders to begin early contract talks with those automakers, talks that are expected to result in a loss of some contract benefits. The automakers have already agreed to those talks, which could begin next week. The Reagan administration today endorsed the creation of a new gold coin, which would be the first gold minted by the United States since 1933. 
The new coin is also favored by most members of the President's Gold Commission. However, Murray Wiedenbaum, the chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, said the gold coin would not represent a return to a gold standard, since the coin would not carry any face value. Meanwhile, the Treasury Department today revealed that it has promised the International Monetary Fund that any return to the gold standard in the United States will be restricted to domestic transactions. And today on world metals markets, the price of gold continued to seesaw around the $400 an ounce level. In Zurich, gold was up almost $3 to close at $400.50. In New York, gold was down $4 to close at $396. Silver fell 11 cents to close at $8.17. The dollar was mixed today, closing lower in Europe, but recouping some of the losses in U.S. trading. The pound closed down 1 cent at $1.91. And in Tokyo, the dollar rose fractionally to close at 221.85 yen. Those developments today relating to AT&T will not, of course, affect the fact that that company remains a major communications power. However, even in the area of long-distance communications, Changes in technology and new firms are carving out strong competition for AT&T. Chris Hardaway reports now from Memphis, Tennessee. Satellite technology is revolutionizing business communications. The industry's giant, Satellite Business Systems, a joint venture of IBM, Aetna, and ComSat, provides high-speed transmission of high volumes of business data, but at high cost to the user. Enter Memphis-based Silex Communications Network, a system that brings the cost of satellite technology within the reach of smaller corporations. The man behind Silex, company president Jim Ziegler, explains the system. Uh, uh, messages that are uh, sent by our users are brought in by leased telephone lines to the satellite earth station in that user's city, say New York, for example. We then send it up to the satellite, and it's sent from the satellite back down again to our central facility here in Memphis. We then examine the messages with our computers to determine what the destination is. Then we send it back to the satellite, and from there it goes down to the satellite Earth station in the destination city, say San Francisco. The brain of the Silex network lies underground, behind 8-inch concrete walls built to withstand an earthquake or a tornado. Every part of the system has a backup. Two satellites and twin antenna dishes provide security for the system's 250 users. And why do they use satellite communications? The attraction of satellite data transmission to a user is twofold. First of all, since the message only goes through one repeating point, and that's the satellite, uh, there's only one part that could possibly fail. Secondly, uh, it offers the potential of lower cost because there are so many fewer components, so much less maintenance and repair work involved. Ziegler cites a 30% savings for the customer using satellite versus leased landline communications, and at those prices, demand is exceeding supply. Perhaps the future of this high-tech industry is best reflected in the numbers on this computer display screen. As one industry analyst told me, the potential is there. Think of it this way, he said. If all 240 million people in the United States and Canada were communicating by computer via satellite at peak load levels, all transmissions could be carried on one quarter of the capacity of a single communication satellite. I'm Chris Hardaway from Memphis for the Nightly Business Report. Uh, by the way, an AT&T spokesman told the Nightly Business Report that satellite systems like Cyclexes are indeed cheaper than AT&T long lines. But the company said it is upgrading its landlines in which it has a huge investment and is looking toward a mixed-use communication system involving both satellites and terrestrial lines. Well, let's uh, involve here ourselves with a short-range hookup and pick up the Master of Communications and Stocks, Paul Kankas. Thank you, Dell. Well, Wall Street's bulls were certainly dialing for dollars today. Let's have a look at those uh, closing averages again. All in the plus column, and the industrials led the way higher with that four and three-quarter point gain. The broadly-based New York Stock Exchange index up a third of a point. Volume, however, down about one and a quarter million shares from yesterday pay, uh, yesterday's pace. Of that 42.6 million, 23 and three-quarter million up volume, only 13 million down volume. And the advanced decline ratio weighted heavily in the favor of winners, nine to five. GPU, General Public Utilities, led the active list on 1.1 million shares. The company reported another unusual event at its Three Mile Island plant, although, according to the company, it turned out to just be a plugged air service hose. 
and incidentally, two of its subsidiaries did receive rate increases today. Warner Communications up strongly. The company's Atari division had a little get-together for stock analysts out in Las Vegas yesterday, and apparently they liked what they heard. El Paso Company up two points, a favorable court ruling on gas price increases. Exxon down an eighth, as was Consolidated Foods, which has agreed to buy Savistop for $16 a share. Kodak, a good gainer in the blue chip section, up one and an eighth. Marathon Oil snapping back after better than a three-point loss yesterday. General Motors over $40 a share with that seven-eighths point gain. Tandy up another half after a strong performance yesterday when the firm reported a 19% increase in December sales. IT&T, another strong blue chip, up one and five-eighths. Widely held issues, Allied Corp up five-eighths. American Telephone and Telegraph was halted at 10.42 this morning, never resumed trading. It was up three-eighths of a point at that time. DuPont unchanged. IBM didn't trade at all today, as you heard Linda say earlier. It closed last at 56 and three quarters yesterday. Mobile up one half. U.S. Steel up one eighth. It did reopen with that uh, eighth point gain. And United Technologies up one half a point. Biscayne Federal Savings and Loan, based in Miami Beach, Florida, up two and three-eighths. We try to reach company officials unsuccessfully for a comment. Integrated Resources is a nice gainer. I saw no late-breaking news there. Grandifil up one and a quarter on the news that Southeastern Public Service, a Victor Posner-controlled company, uh, was... Uh, uh, has obtained about 10% or a little bit better interest in the uh, Grandifil firm. Travelers Insurance up nicely on the news of a two-for-one stock split and a boost in the quarterly dividend to 82 cents from 72 cents. Parker Penn spilling a little red ink here today, down one and three-eighths. I saw no late-breaking developments there. Wainoco Oil down as uh, speculation about a buyout apparently was on the wane, so to speak. Over the American exchange, a one and a third point gain in the market value index on a slight increase in volume and advances outpaced declines rather handily. Supron Energy on 212,000 shares led the active list unchanged after recent nice gains. Houston Trust gaining a quarter, Dome Petroleum up one-eighth. Intertech Data losing a half, but Triton Energy a strong performance up one and an eighth. GNC Energy and Grant Industries, the two big percentage gainers on the curb today. No late-breaking news that I saw on either issue. Howell Industries and Barnes Engineering, the two biggest percentage losers. Over the counter trading, a little better than a one-point gain in the composite index, but on a uh, rather sharp decrease in volume. Topping the active list was MCI Communications, and strangely enough, the company plunged as much as five and a quarter points this morning. They got what they wanted with this AT&T settlement, but apparently uh, investors think otherwise. CBD Corp up uh, one quarter, Apple Computer rising seven-eighths after a big loss yesterday, Intel Corp unchanged, and Mallinckrodt uh, up one-eighth of a point. Well, today's early report of that half-point uh, rise in December unemployment to 8.9% pushed bond prices in the long end of the maturity spectrum up as much as a full point, or $10 per $1,000 in face value, in the early going this morning. The reason, of course, as I mentioned before, was the news of a worsening recession implies a corresponding decline in interest rates, which is good for bond prices. Another plus factor was an easing of the Fed funds rate to 11 and 7 eighths percent from yesterday's 12 and a quarter percent level. Although there wasn't too much trading activity today, especially ahead of the weekly money supply report, short-term bonds closed up quarters, while the long end gained three-quarters of a point on the average. And that's today's close-up look at Wall Street. Linda? Well, in a decision that could set off a legal war between American steel producers and their foreign counterparts, the administration today said it will discontinue the trigger price mechanism designed to keep underpriced foreign steel from entering this country. Commerce Secretary Malcolm Baldridge says the trigger price system is not working because American and European steelmakers fail to agree on what constitutes fair prices for steel. Paul? With today's major developments on such uh, Dow stocks as uh, American Telephone, IBM, and U.S. Steel, how much more fortunate could we be but to have the acknowledged keeper of the Dow 30, uh, William M. Lefebvre, the uh, vice president and uh, the chief uh, market analyst for Purcell Graham. He's with us tonight, and uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you, Bill, and congratulate you on that fine article last week in Time Magazine, you chartist gnome, you. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> it's great to have you with us. Bill, uh, before we get into the events of today, what I'd like to ask you uh, is a brief recap uh, of this week. We started Monday on a nice uptick, seven and a half point closing gain on the Dow. What was going on there? Well, the usual reinvestment demand as the new year started. Uh, and of course, uh, I think given uh, the absence of some events that we'll get to in a moment, that would have continued. Of course, Tuesday, uh, we had a down day. 17 uh, and a half points worth. <laughs> that's right. Uh, a couple of things. We had, uh, after the close on Monday, they had the uh, uh, money figures come out, up one and a half billion when everybody thought they'd be flat to down 800 million. Strangely enough, today's money figures were down 1.4 right. billion. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, we had the 
good Dr. Henry Kaufman, known as Dr. Doom in some circles, come out and uh, really uh, uh, prognosticate much higher interest rates and all. Actually, what he is currently saying is what he's been saying right along. And uh, I was somewhat surprised that the market took uh, that much notice of it. Yes. Uh, it followed through with Wednesday, a little over a four-point loss on the Dow. Yeah. And then finally Thursday, we had a little uptick, three-quarters of a point gain. Reflex rally, technically based, would you say? I, I think Thursday's rally told you that we'd, we'd get something today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then today, uh, uh, you know, a fairly decent closing uh, gain in the Dow. That's uh, right. About Could have been much better, though. Right, yeah. Now, let's get down to your specialty, Bill. You are the official keeper of the Dow Industrial 30, and three of your stocks of those 30 were top-notch news today. Let's take American Telephone's case. Well, uh, of course, American Telephone reached an agreement with the Justice Department to end its antitrust action, which is now between six and seven years old. Mm -hmm. uh, in essence, uh, AT&T will divest itself of its 23 operating companies. Now, uh, they have six months to uh, um, develop their plan of uh, divestiture. And, uh, okay, let me just ask you quickly, uh, what's this going to do for the stock on Monday morning? My guess is that since the sum of the parts is usually in Wall Street greater than the whole, the uh, stock will open higher. I would not be surprised to see it open at 60 or higher. Uh, how about such competitors like MCI Communications and over-the-counter stock, which is very active? Uh, how, what effect do you think it will have on MCI? Well, I, I'm sure that there will be some buoyancy there, but uh, long term, this development is much more important to the AT&T stockholders than it is to the MCI stockholders. I see. So uh, you're looking above 60 for an opening on American 60 Telephone. 60 or better. I would think so. Very yeah. possibly. Yeah. yeah. It closed uh, around 58 and 5 eighths today, so that would be That's a nice right. move. Had it opened today at that price, we would have had a much better uh, closing gain in the Dow. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, now, let's take the case of IBM briefly. Uh, well, now, IBM has uh, been in the midst of a, of a trial for some time. They're, they have an antitrust action that goes back uh, 13 close to years. 13 years. 13 right. years. Now, that was, uh, rec uh, the judge recommended that it be dismissed. And uh, once again, if uh, that stock had been allowed to trade today, chances are it would have been up around 60 or higher. Yeah, it didn't trade at all. So you look for a strong mm -hmm. opening on IBM Monday morning. IBM and telephone, yes. Very good. Uh, so we, we could be looking at, uh, with those two stocks alone, maybe a five or six, seven point gain in the Dow? Very possibly, maybe even more. Now, you know, if those two open up strong, it would tend to spread to the rest of the list, which would, uh, uh, as an example, for instance, if each stock in the Dow went up a half a point, mm -hmm. you're talking something better than 10 points on the average. Mm -hmm. You could have a very good day on Monday, and it could continue for a while. Do you think that the uh, developments of today with regard to the Justice Department and these major corporations is a signal that free enterprise is coming back into vogue? <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> it, all, it all hails well for the market uh, uh, starting next week then. I guess we have a Republican in the White House. Let's put it that way. Very good. Bill, it's been a pleasure having you with us. Uh, our time is up, but uh, we'll be looking closely Monday morning to see how your predictions uh, fare. Sure. William M. LaFay, Vice President and uh, Chief Mar Market Strategist for Purcell Graham in New York. And coming up, Alfred Kahn gives us his point of view on the recent patterns of some economic statistics. The wife of New York Governor Hugh Carey has responded to a report in Fortune magazine claiming that American Invesco, a condominium company founded by her family, is on the edge of bankruptcy. Evangeline Carey says the Fortune article is totally inaccurate and says, quote, the amount of Invesco's indebtedness is only a small fraction of what Fortune said it was. Mrs. Carey also claims that the firm has agreed with its major lenders on a plan to restructure its debt. Civil rights leader Jesse Jackson has targeted some of the nation's largest beverage producers for a boycott as part of a campaign that he calls Push for Economic Justice. Jackson said the object of that campaign is to single out firms that practice discriminatory practices in hiring, advertising, and merchandising, but depend on blacks for a large part of their sales. Jackson said firms that are being considered as possible targets include Pepsi-Cola, 7-Up, Dr. Pepper, Hubline, Schlitz, Miller, and Seagram.
In tonight's commentary, Cornell University professor and former presidential advisor Alfred Kahn gives us his perspective on the meaning of some recent statistical trends. I have on several occasions expressed some caution about how much success we really have been having in combating inflation. At the risk of repeating myself a little bit, I thought it would be helpful if you could look at the charts uh, that have been prepared for me by National Economic Research Associates in New York, uh, not to show that there's been no success, but to show how limited it has been so far and that the danger is still there. I think we'll have to concentrate on the consumer price index. Observe that these are three-month moving averages. That is, the figure for November will be the average for September, October, and November to eliminate some of the month-by-month -month squiggles. The black figure is the reported CPI. Please observe, first of all, there was a very disturbing increase, almost back to the 13% level of 1980 in the summer, but that there is some improvement if you look carefully, and especially if you recognize that this figure is going down. But observe, second, that this has been confined almost entirely to energy prices, to food prices, and in recent months to mortgage interest rates and the cost of new homes. And of course, that's what killed us in 79 and 80. If you take those out and get a picture of what we call the underlying rate, this red one, you'll observe that so far there is no real improvement. There is some improvement in the producer, a wholesale price index, but it is very largely raw materials, which go down when you have a recession and come back in recovery. To see what that underlying rate really consists of, we ought to look for a moment at the principal component of business costs, which is wages. Now, wages had very little to do with the explosion of inflation in 79 and 80. Those were largely food and energy and mortgage interest rates. But if you recognize that wage costs are 75% of total costs, then it becomes very important if we're going to grind inflation down to have a look at what hourly compensation is doing, and that's the black line, which we'll have to concentrate on. There is some downtrend, but in the last third quarter of 1981, which is the last we have, it still is around 9% per year. That means that our real hope of getting inflation down has got to concentrate on the new contracts, the United Automobile Workers, the rubber tire industry, the oil workers, and the Teamsters. If they begin to come down to 4 and 5 percent, then we will make some progress. And that completes this edition of the Nightly Business Report for Friday, January 8th. And for all of us on the Nightly Business Report, good night. The Nightly Business Report is made possible by grants from Cities Service Company, an energy, chemicals, and minerals company. And by W.R. Grace, a company involved in chemicals, natural resources, and consumer products. And by public television stations throughout the nation.